Okay, um, April 2015, GNU Radio Dev Call, starting now. Six minutes past the full hour, so nearly on time. Pretty good for us, actually. Um, we have a couple of items on the agenda, most of which are announcements. <coughs> so there will be a few actual discussions. Um, but it's quite a lot of announcements, so um, let's go straight into it. So we have GRCon, which was announced last week on the mailing list, um, but we know for, for, as a fact that some people haven't actually heard about this. So um, there's a news item now on the website, and I, I don't know why Tom is it on. Do we have a Do we have like an, a conference website like we had like we had last year? Is we, it we, website? we do, but I so if it's just uh, here, let me pull it up and put it into the chat room. It's very temporary. We are. That's, that's something that we haven't really spoken uh, publicly about, but we are trying to build a much better uh, website. Um, hold on one second. Let me put it into the chat bot. Um, so that's not it. So while you're doing that, just let me throw out the, the hard facts. So it'll be in DC again, um, August 24th through 28th. So it's a bit earlier than last year. That was actually, but we put a lot of thought into that. So, um, especially in the DC area, um, we'll have a lot of people from industry and defense coming, which means we have to adhere to the fiscal cycle. So, the end of that is usually a good time to have conferences, but all the other conference organizers, they also know this. So, that's why September is chock a block with conferences. So we try to avoid, um, you know, all the big IEEE conferences, et cetera, which means we went to the end of August. And we already have a venue as well. So it's the Center for Strategic and International Studies in DC. And yeah, we expect the conference to be a bit bigger than last year. And obviously, we're looking for participation, presentations, etc. Sponsors, of course, um, all that. Yep, yeah, and um, so just so everybody knows, uh, once again, John Malsbury and Michael Dickens, um, and then kind of as a third party myself, are uh, doing most of the the legwork for uh, the conference. So they're they're kind of our those two are the the go to people and doing all of the work. Um, this is not to shame like to try to publicly shame them or point them out, but to actually just make sure that they get the credit that they uh, that I think they really deserve for all of the work that they've already put into it and will be putting into it. Um, so having been said, uh, we're we're. We're on track now that we've got the venue set up. Um, you know, we've been, this is our fifth one, so I think things are going to move a little bit more uh, smoothly uh, from our perspective. So I, you know, so things should be good. Uh, but as uh, Martin said, call for participation. Make sure you get your, uh, you know, any any uh, talks that you want to submit. Um, we'll 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 make decisions and, and you know make make sure people get notified. But talk, tell us if you want to you know demo some of your work or have a poster or something like that, so we can uh, uh, make sure that we have the space and everything uh, set up for that. Uh, and as I was talking about, so I put in the chatbot notes that the using Trondo.com, my my personal website, which we've used for the past few years, uh, we've put a, a landing page right now to uh, for the conference, just so that there is information out there. Um, but we are working on trying to get a much better uh, page that will be on GNURadio.org, um, and that, that will be kind of the future of where all the information is going to be, and, and I'll probably just, you know, make a redirect link on my, my page. Um, so yeah, I think that I think Martin mentioned most of the stuff. Uh, Michael, do you have as one of the the main guys here? Do you have anything you'd like to add? No, not at this time. Uh, we're still working on the website and other things. So hang in there. We'll get the word out as soon as we know it. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, no, I'm pretty. Uh, I'm getting excited again about this one, uh, especially now that we've got the venue thing sorted out. Um, I'm actually f I was a little hesitant about the venue, but uh, seeing more of it and talking to them, I'm actually really excited about what this place is going to be able to offer us as a, as a space and you know amenities and all that stuff. So it should be really good. Yeah, the one thing which I do like about it a lot is that it offers a space for expansion. So if we fill it up this year and we really like it, we could go back next year again and occupy even more of it potentially. 
We'll see. Yeah. Dang. Yep. So that assumes they'll have us back. <laughs> yeah, that's the question in its own right. We'll just have to see. Yeah. Okay, so conference, everyone, go there, be there. It'll be awesome. Um, yeah, I think that's all the data we need right now. Um, Tom already mentioned the main organizers and the website, so I think all contacts and all questions should be answered through that. Let's move to the next item, the Hackfest, which is more of a wrap-up thing. Um, so we had a Hackfest two weeks ago, was it two weeks ago? In, um, in the Edis Galactic Headquarters in Santa Clara. It's quite interesting. Uh, we had a lot of people, so like 25 people, and a lot of things happened. So like we had a record number of pull requests, I heard. Um, many good things went down. <clears throat> There's actually a wiki website on our, that's a wiki page on our wiki that sh shows some of the things that happened. It's really too much to list them all, to be honest, because we had a lot of stuff. Is there anything that we want to point out in particular? Maybe the Vox um, cutover happened during that week. That's something that is worth pointing out. Vox is now. Um, its own project, and it lives in Gunner Radio as a sub-module for now, so we can don't have versioning issues. But Volk and Gunner Radio are now... Um, I, w I don't want to say separate projects, because that sounds like forking and splitting, and we really are still a lot of the same developers co collaborating and um, you know, using one... Volk, Gunner Radio uses Volk very heavily, but it's it's project by its own rights, mainly led by Nathan at this point, has its own website, its own... Um, IRC channel, yeah, so that would work pretty well, I think. Yeah, yeah, uh, I mean, kind of, it's not legally, like, that's not the right word, but, but structure-wise, Volk is still a sub-project of GNU Radio. It just lives as a separate library, and Nathan as the, Nathan West is the maintainer. Um, so, yeah, as, as, as Martin said, it's not a, we're not, Splitting it off, there's no fragmentation here. It's it just we thought this was a better place for it to live, but it's it's still for from the Free Software Foundation's perspective, it's it's still a GNU Radio project. Um, let's see, yeah, what else happened? You know, the the main thing for the Hackfest was we were running up to the three seven seven release, so we got a ton of stuff done on that. Um, I th like when I made my my. Uh, little wrap-up talk at the end of the Hackfest. I think I had like 61 commits or something like that, but I think over the, the actual week, once everything kind of settled and we did get all the pull requests uh, done, there was something like 80 pull requests, and um, which means more commits uh, effect effectively settled because of the Hackfest. Um, so that was really cool. Uh, we got a lot done. Um, I'll point out that we no longer have PyQWT as a direct dependency of GNU Radio, so we've actually removed a dependency uh, from the project. Um, usually didn't affect too many people. I think the OSX and the embedded people were the, the uh, areas that had the biggest trouble with the PyQWT. Um, I guess a little aside on that, the GR filter design tool still does use PyQWT. I looked on the flight home to see how easy it would be to remove that dependency and replace it with something else like PySide or even Matplotlib or something like that. Um, and it's not going to be, it's not a trivial, like, let me hack on a red-eye home type of uh, event uh, or, or project. But hopefully, eventually, we can we can get that out of there as well. But the design tool is, you know, it's an optional thing. It's a thing you can run in your, yourself. And what it will do is if you don't have PyQWT, it will, ask, it will tell you and it'll, give you, point you to where you can actually find it. So, um, so it's not completely removed, but it's no longer an actual dependency of GNU Radio. So that was a good thing. Um, is there anything else that... There's tons done. There's so um, many things. I, I highly recommend having a look at the wiki page. Um, I don't think listing them all right now is, is going to help anyone. Yeah, I just thought... I, I, I wanted to get out there that we're actually... We've reduced dependencies in GNU Radio. Yeah, um, that is... That is really <laughs> That is pretty cool. So actually, there's one thing I'm going to point out as a segue to the next um, topic, as long as... as in, oh, or does someone want to say something about the Hackfest? 
Actually, I'd like to say, you know, it's really nice having you all over at the headquarters. Pretty cool. Um, made yeah, we, we always like our Edis, Edis Hackfest. Those are, they, we've gotten a lot done because of that. It's a good, it's a good open space, uh, you know, a lot of freedom to work, do whatever we needed to, we need to do. So, yeah, it's, those are always awesome. Yeah, it was, it was a great event. It was really nice seeing um, a whole bunch of students there, especially from Virginia Tech. Uh, it was just it's like they're the next generation of people who could be doing GNU radio in the future so let's uh, it was great seeing there great working with them hope they continue on working with us and we got pull requests from all of them awesome so we we, we started to to work them into the the des- the development flow they can be sort of like the next Nathan <laughs> that's right <laughs> right okay nice um I think we all agree it was really good, highly productive. It was nice to have everyone in the same building so we could just sit down, have meetings, and decide stuff. <clears throat> and one of the things that we did wrap up there was um, the beta release of Seagran. So um, that's, this was also announced on the mailing list, but Seagran.org is now back up. It's a website that um, it doesn't itself host out of tree modules, but it lists them. And the way that works, just in case you haven't heard about this, is that um, anything that is in PyBombs, in the PyBombs recipe list, automatically gets pulled into Seagram. So there's really nothing you have to do that about that. But um, what you should do to augment or to provide more information or metadata is uh, put a manifest file into your out-of-tree module. That you know, the end uh, Seagram will use that to. Um, yeah, to populate its individual pages. So head over to cgrand.org and um, you'll see a nice orange website that is automatically generated and, um, yeah, it gets automatically updated. I don't know how often, every, you know, once a day or something. Um, yeah, but if you add a um, manifest file to your out of tree module and then push that to GitHub or whatever your official repository location is, it'll automatically be updated in Seagram. I'd like to thank uh, Nathan and Ravi in particular, although there were lots of other people who helped make that happen. Yeah, but like, I'd like to look, like, thank those two in particular because especially Ravi with this whole design work um, makes a huge difference from our usual crappy designs that we cobble together and then promise to improve upon, but you know, rarely do. Okay. Seagran. Oh, where's my list? You actually skipped one of the uh, items. Um, actually, I didn't skip it. Yeah. <laughs> it just Seagran made more sense at this point. Sure. Um, I I just lost the actual list of items. Too many browser tabs open. Yeah. Okay. Actually, okay, the QT updates probably would have worked as well um, because we also worked on QT during um, the Hackfest. And really, there's not that much to say, but it keeps coming up as, like, people keep arguing about QT, um, and we've been trying to improve it, so there's so there's less and less reasons to use WX, which we will eventually deprecate. Like, we've been saying this for a long time, and we haven't been kidding about it, like in one of the upcoming generated versions, and it won't be very f- near in the future, but it'll it'll happen eventually. WX will be deprecated and will be removed from the tree, and we'll have one set of graphical widgets in our official tree, and that'll be the QT widgets. Um, so if there's anything you, that you think we should improve, then we'd like to know about that. But I think we've already gone a very far way in making them really useful. And Tom especially has done most of the work and also recently posted a blog post on his blog about that. Do you want to say anything towards that, Tom? Uh, well, I guess, yeah, the, the reason for the blog post is to expose what is available, like a few of the, the features that you can enable, disable, uh, toggle in real time. Um, you know, again, a lot of this stuff was in the manual, but it was written in a way that was like, here's, you know, it was very manual-ish, dry stuff. So I tried to put a blog post up just to kind of expose it, show you some graphics. Um, and a lot of it, you know, this is one of the things that, that I guess has bugged me about some of the criticisms of the QT stuff is none of this is particularly difficult. 
Um, so, you know, I didn't actually work a whole lot on this in the Hackfest. You know, that there was, I was trying to, you know, focus my attention on other things. The the most of this, like, of the new work that is shown on the, the wiki, some of it was actually old work, but the, the new work, like, having the ability to have a control panel, which is a big complaint. Um, you know, we had this drop-down menu that you could get to with the middle mouse button, and, you know, you could kind of control the entire graph and display that way, but, you know, people wanted this control panel, like, is in the WX thing. I was against that because I didn't like how much screen real estate that that thing takes up. So, but I feel like, okay, well, what if we actually have a control panel that you can open and close? You can do it in GRC by setting a, a, a yes or no toggle. You can actually do it in the, uh, while it's running, or by going, going to the drop-down menu and just clicking the control panel check bot, you know, um, uh, menu item or, you know, to enable or disable it. Now, having actually done it and have it, I'm like, okay, this is actually, this is an incredibly useful thing. So I'm, I, I understand for a lot of purposes, like, how do you set the trigger properly and, you know, some of these things. It is really nice to have that there, and I, but I like the fact that it can just disappear when I don't need it. But the problem that I had was, like, I did that while sitting in talks during the Embedded Linux conference, and I was still listening to the talks, right? This isn't really complicated stuff. It's just a matter of getting all the details correct of, okay, this th this signal has to connect to that slot, and I need to make sure that the menu and the control panel were, you know, both being toggled at the same time, so, you know, you could do one and it would show up as, as in both places, you know. So there's some details there, but it's not incredibly difficult. So, you know, people who complain, it's not like we can't do this, it's just that we haven't spent the time to do it. So that's really what I keep asking people for, is people who complain about this, you know, the the, the thing that I often get is, oh, it's missing so many things, and I'm like, okay, what? And then I rarely get any actual responses. Um, so, so, you know, providing me with, or providing us with, here are some concrete things that would help make it better, um, we can make it better. You know, Qt is a full-fledged, really powerful graphics library that's used all over the place. So there's very little that we can't do with it, uh, as long as we know what the real demands on, on it are. So I think that's all I really wanted to say about that. Yes. Cool. Um, yeah, that's. I think that's pretty much all we need to say about it. Um, I'm going to say it again, WX will go away. Please migrate to Qt. And if there's anything that's really wrong with it, fix it yourself or tell us about it. We want Qt, which is to be really good. OK, um, enough about Qt, though. The next item on the agenda is the new SDR <coughs> conference in New England. and. Neil isn't on the call, so I'm just going to ask you, Tom, again. To <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the, the New England, uh, it's New SDR stands for New England Workshop on Software Defined Radio. Um, I forget how many years it's been going on, at least four, maybe five now. Uh, and it's usually, it's either in Boston or Worcester in Massachusetts, um, partly be, you know, because the people who are in charge of it are either affiliated with some place in Boston, like Boston University, or Worcester Polytechnic, uh, WPI. Uh, so this year it's being held at WPI campus. Um, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, I believe it's free. I'm pretty sure it's free. Uh, I think you just have to pre-register. So if you're in the New England area and can get to, to, Boston, you know, to, to Worcester fairly easily, one day event, free registration, just, you know, just pre-register, show up. Um, Great talks. I think they've got. I know. Well, they've got Fred Harris this year uh, as the keynote. Miriam Lesser, and who else was? Uh, oh, and uh, um, uh, Professor Mitch Kokar. Uh, some really interesting kind of invited and keynote presentations. I'm looking forward to seeing the rest of it. So it's great just for for that perspective. It is, as I said, it's a one day event. So it's not like you're going to come that far out of the way to to get there. But it is specifically designed to be the New England one. The main reason to bring this up is that I wanted to mention for those who are in the area is the Thursday before the workshop. So the workshop is a, is a full day on Friday. The Thursday before, we're actually doing a a GNU Radio. Uh, what did I call it? The GNU Radio hack, hacking work, hacking GNU Radio workshop, or something like that. We called it. Uh, Neil Pandaya put out a uh, email on the mailing list, and we'll try to get that information, uh, you know, up and all over the place um, as soon as we can. 
But it's basically going to be like a four to five hour evening workshop where we'll introduce GNU Radio, we'll show you some of the tools, how to work with some of the stuff. So there'll be like this bit of, a, of an intro thing. But the main thing is that we want to lead teams, uh, you know, pairs or groups of people in developing a GNU Radio application. So it's going to be more of a sit down, hands on. Let's let's go through and and uh, and hack on GNU Radio, and and by the end of the night, come out with you know working some working radio. Um, so that's going to be the goal. So it, it should be for more introduction to to GNU Radio for people. So this is going to be hugely uh, you know for for people who are significantly advanced in it. Um, but you know, we'll uh, I'll be there, and, and a few other of the the GNU Radio kind of um, developers and, and specialists will be there, so we can you know, answer questions and, and get into depth as, as much as you need to. Again, it, it I, uh, it's a free event. Um, we just have to pre-register, so we just have to know that you're coming. Um, should be a really fun uh, few hours of working on GNU Radio. The only thing that I think Neil has said that you need to provide yourself if you're coming is a laptop. Um, we are going to be providing, I believe it's going to be, an, we should have enough user B200s for, for the expected crowd that we think we'll get, um, as well as the live DVD or, or the, the bootable, um, I think we're going to have a bootable USB stick for this with GNU Radio. It's, it's going to be based on Jonathan Corgan's uh, image uh, to boot off of it, which... I think we checked. I think uh, Seth at the Hackfest pointed out that it does actually boot uh, on OS X or on on uh, on MacBooks. Uh, so if you have a MacBook, you know, you, it should still work. Uh, I've had really good success with it on MacBooks. Yeah, I think previous versions, and, and it might be before the uh, EFI and stuff like that, but I think previous versions had difficulty, so I was always skeptical, but they, they seem be okay these days. Yeah, we've tried it on a MacBook Air and a MacBook Pro Retina and a couple others, and it seems to be pretty stable. So, Great. awesomeness. Okay. So, yeah, so, so don't worry about that. Um, just bring your laptop, and we'll have a, you know, a, a B200 so you, you can play. If you come with your own installation, you can do Radio 2. Absolutely, that's that's fine. Um, but this will help if you don't, and if you don't want to worry about it, we'll, we'll have all of that support for you. Um, so, yeah, so that's, that's happening... Uh, after saying all this stuff, like I said, I'll get the email from Neil out to other places. We'll put a news item on GNURadio.org, but it's going to be Thursday, May 21st in uh, Worcester Polytechnic uh, in Worcester, Mass. All right. I appended the URL to the conference, hopefully into the right window. <laughs> I keep missing <laughs> IRC windows. Um, that's that. The last item I have before we talk about working groups is summer of code in space. So I just, you know, I've been talking about this for the last two calls already. We, um, we weren't accepted for the GSOC this year, but we were accepted for summer of code in space. And uh, we haven't had a whole lot of response, but we already have, we have one slot. Um, and we already have one application, which is looking pretty good. Um, that said, um, I wouldn't mind more interest in this in this program. Yeah. But anyone who wanted to apply at this point have to would have to hurry up. So the application deadline is end of April. Summer of Code in Space is basically like GSOC, um, just handled by the ESA, the European Space Agency. There's some different like uh, the requirements for participation are a bit different and I don't know them from the top of my head, but I will post the Socket um, website URL in chat <coughs> for people to look things up. Okay, um, let's talk about the working groups. So um, I'm just gonna say that we'll probably be treating both a bit differently in the future because it becomes a project. And also Nathan is right on the group right now. We already talked about the split up, so I don't think we really need to talk about Volk at this point. Also, the community working group, which always had its special status, is um, currently so the we have the the C grant um, working the the C grant task force, which is still active. But other than that, there's not, not really much action, and we already talked about C grant. Um, okay, so what about the rest? I know that um, GSC has been working pretty hard recently, Bastian. 
yes. Well, um, there were a couple of changes that made it into the new release. Um, aside from like various GUI tweaks, um, the most prominent thing would probably be the block comments feature, which is, I guess, a lot of people wanted for a long time. Um, in essence, there is now a, a property to every block uh, located in the advanced tab that lets you enter text or comments to a block, and whatever you put in there is displayed underneath the block in the canvas. And this can, of course, be uh, disabled. You can hide all those comments away, but it's, I guess, a nice feature to kind of document what, what a block does. And I also figure it'll be nice for examples. You can like, put a whole text underneath a block and explain what it does and how to use it, maybe, in an example. <laughs> Yeah, I was a little skeptical of this idea at first, uh, and then like the example that you showed, Sebastian, at first was like there was this huge long bit of text underneath one of the blocks just to show that you could do it, I guess. But I was like, oh, I don't know about that. Um, but Jonathan uh, shared we were working on something, and he shared a, a, a flow graph with me with some you know annotated blocks, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's fantastic. It's a really good feature to to help explain and expose what, you know, what each block is specifically doing or, or maybe certain settings that you want. And it, it, it's a really good feature. OK, glad. Um, yeah, there's some other changes um, on the way, which are um, uh, the bypass blocks feature, which Ceph has been working on. And there also might be a variable explorer sort of GUI that lets you um, edit all variables in a uh, flow graph in one uh, dialog. But that's not quite done yet, so we'll have to wait maybe f to the next call um, for this to make it. Other than that, um, we had a dev call um, two days ago in which we discussed a f possible switch of the block wrapper format from XML to JAML in the future. This will, of course, be um, supported alongside the current XML for a while, but um, we'll look into how to make that switch and also change out the templating um, from Cheetah, which you might now recognize as all these dollar variables, um, to Mako, which lets us at some point in the future switch to Python 3. Woohoo! Yeah. Yeah, I guess we're we're still debating the use of YAML for this. I guess we're kind of mostly there. And one of the reasons uh, that we chose it is because the manifest for all of the for for C Grant and Pi Bombs and uh, and the auditory projects, we're using YAML for that. So it's one of those things where it's like we might as well let's reduce all of the the various scripting languages that we have right now and and try to centralize on you know. Where, where it makes sense, centralize on, on the same thing, so we can just get used to one of them. And also, if you haven't used YAML, um, I mean, I'm, I'm talking to the general audience here, I know that you have. Um, it's really easy to edit in a text editor. It's super simple. Um, and it you know, has markdown support and all of that. You know, manually editing XML files is really annoying, and um, editing YAML files is much nicer. I agree. Nice. So, um, yeah, so, so Sebastian's working group is doing lot, lots of work, and I'd just like to remind people that you know, everyone uses GRC, and it's kind of assumed to be, you know, it's taken for granted, I'd, I'd like to say. There's a lot of tedious GUI work that needs to be done, and really appreciate more collaborators um, on that end of GNU Radio. We have lots of people who help us with fixing signal processing, blocks and all of that. Working on GUI seems to be less popular, and I'd really like to um, encourage people to start helping with the working group, the GSC working group, because people will, will love you for it. They'll buy your beers, I promise that, because GSC is one thing that really everyone uses. OK. Um, Phil, do you have any updates from the embedded side? <coughs> Yeah, um, so I've got the, the the repo manifest is in pretty good shape for the la the uh, the Dizzy OE release, and that should continue to be stable. 
and should only have minor updates now. We've got all the PyQt stuff in, so you can actually build images that will run uh, Qt GUI and uh, the range widget, which was the one that was tripping over PyQwt. And in the next few weeks, um, there's been a new OE release called Fido, and I'll start working on a test manifest, a branch of the manifest for that. Um, for people who want to start worrying about that and leave the dizzy stuff just to become more and more stable, it'll probably only see you know serious bug fixes and CVE updates from here. Um, so that's about it. Oh yeah, and we found a bug in Volk that affects ARM, but we may have a fix. Is the fix you use the generic kernel? Or is it, is it generic? <laughs> Actually, the fix is use the Neon kernel instead of uh, Neon Asm, and Doug sent me a patch that we should I should be able to test in the next few days, or more likely early next week. Um, Doug, Doug, yeah. Yeah, so I don't have a, a whole lot. Uh, I did send out and exchange a few emails for folks uh, right before the Hackfest, which unfortunately I wasn't able to attend. Um, and I have a branch up on uh, my GitHub with uh, the custom buffer work. Um, I need to organize another development call with folks to try and uh, keep momentum going on that. Um, so there, there is a, a, a branch that people can look at uh, to see w what we're planning to do with the custom buffers, but other than that, not, not a whole lot to report. Yeah, the coprocessor working group, I think in particular, has a little bit of a, a higher barrier to entry. I mean, even though we have, like many of us have coprocessors, we just might not know about it or really have that much of a need to, to make use of it. Um, but I think that's going to be the thing is to figure out, uh, to identify how people can can explore this space a little bit better. Um I don't really have any suggestions on that right now, but I think that's that's just kind of an explanation here of of maybe why it's it's slow for people to pick up on this this particular project or this set of projects in the coprocessor space, um, and people are yeah I just don't know if people are, are seeing where we would like to go with it. So hopefully we can once we get a little bit more in there and and expose it a little bit better, people will start to to realize. To have test cases, experience, you know, um, and in use cases for this type of stuff. Well, I've certainly heard from people who would be interested in having it in place. Of course, because it's not in place yet, they can't test it. So mm -hmm. hopefully, we'll get that in place in like May if we're lucky, and uh, allow people to test it over the summertime before the actual conference starts, so that we can have some interesting discussions during the conference. Okay. I'm sort of hoping this is my May project, but it kind of depends on what um, Edis folks are interested in. Okay. Hey. Uh, Tim, do, I don't know if you can even speak. <laughs> if you want to say something. Type into chat. <laughs> Blink your eyes once for... <laughs> but Tim actually mentioned earlier that he's having connection troubles, so um, yeah, um, so we're probably gonna skip the, skip his stuff. But I'd like to mention that we did work on uh, modems and stuff at the Hackfest, so there's been some motion um, towards better, um, yeah, packet data transmission handling and all of that. Also, Tim has an interesting blog. Where he, like where he explains some of those concepts, which I I'll just plug. Yeah, where is the O'Shea research? Okay, um, I didn't miss any working groups, right? This time, we just had a release, so there's going to be a bit quiet on that front until the next call. Um, yeah, does anyone else have anything they wanted to bring up? Uh, Jonathan, should we talk about? Do you want to have anything else to say about the uh, the release, the latest release? Other than I need to uh, actually finish dribbling this out and get it up on the uh, website and uh, out to the list, uh, but that should be happening in the next day. Okay. 
Okay. I'm working on updating all that crap inside of Mac ports. It's always fun. Yeah, uh, just to say one thing about so 3.7.7 is the latest release, and this has been planned for uh, for a couple months now, I guess. And as I mentioned before, the Hackfest was a bit of a ramp up into this particular release, and then uh, it was kind of officially packaged uh, late Sunday uh, through Monday. And uh, yeah, the, the change notes will be coming soon, and big announcements will be coming soon. Um, but I'm I'm pretty happy with with this one. It's got a lot of cool new features in it, a lot, I think we, we hit a number of stability points that we've been meaning to hit for a while, uh, so I think this is going to be a pretty pretty important one for us. Until the next one, of course. Speaking of which, uh, we're moving on to the Devel stuff. Do you want to talk about Thrift and Control Port yet, Tom, or is that, you know, uh, that? No, that's probably sure, I'll, I'll, um, since we're not running late on time here. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, just yesterday, and then there's there's a patch on it uh, this morning. We basically in master we have revived the use of control port. Uh, once again, control port was technically always there. It was just essentially unusable because there was no backend support for it. Uh, so between uh, Doug Geiger, who kind of I guess championed in a way the use of thrift, um, or at least exposed it to us as the as a way that we can kind of the most easy way to replace uh, ice, which is what we were current or, or previously using. Um, thrift seemed like a like a nice replacement for that. Uh, so he he took the initial kind of head start on how to implement a control port with Thrift. Uh, then I picked it up, uh, kind of looking at the server side uh, issues of it. Uh, and then I actually worked um, with Nate Gergen a lot on fixing it up, uh, fixing a lot of the Thrift issues up. We fixed a, a number of, I, th I think, a number of control port issues themselves. We now have a, a client-side Python abstraction layer where most of the client side stuff was very particular to the back ends and how the back end was was implemented we're now creating abstraction layers for that so that from a, a python side when you're writing your python application um, uh, you can you, you should more easily be able to go between these back ends if we enable multiple of them you know, uh, uh, more of them, uh, so I think it's uh, it's in a pretty good shape. It's in a lot better shape uh, now than than it was even before we removed ice. I think everything is a lot more stable, a lot a lot cleaner, a lot easier to to, to work with. Um, but more importantly, it actually works again. So you can you can build it if you can build Thrift. Um, and there's a wiki page. Let me pull that up. There's a wiki page on on Control Port and Thrift um, that. Uh, um, it explains a little bit about well, it explains control port. It explains a little bit about uh, thrift and 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 uh, building it because we are using the latest version of thrift, which is zero point nine point two. So it's a fairly young project uh, in a lot of ways. Except, I mean, it's it's used in a lot of instances, but it's fairly young. Um, most of the package managers that I've looked into do not package the latest version, the 0.9.2. They'll either be 0.9.0 or 0.9.1. Um, 0.9.2 was, I decided to, to use that anyways, even though it's not the most available, because it has a very important feature for us, which is get port. So before, you could launch a service, a server, but it would you could never figure out what port it was using. So now there's a really easy way to ask it, okay, what's your, what, what ephemeral port have you chosen for this particular server? So we use that. That's really important to our use case of, uh, of control port. So we're focusing on that. Uh, also has a number of bug fixes in it. So there's information on this wiki page for how to build Thrift. It's fairly easy. I mean, it's you know it's about the, the simple you know configure make make install type scripts. Uh, it doesn't have very many dependencies, uh, but there's a little bit of a of a couple of hints that I put in there because it does have some dependencies that configure doesn't properly check for. So they need a little bit of work on their. Uh, on their build system um, to properly check before you try to build it. Uh, but I put all that information online for people. Um, there is a known or suspected bug. There's a known bug that we suspect is in Thrift itself, which only happens very rarely when you're shutting down the system. 
Uh, Nathan found a has a fix for that that I believe he submitted uh, as a patch to Thrift, and we've actually put the diff into GNU Radio so that if you're running into this, if this is something that you're hitting and it's important to you, we wanted to make sure that the patch was available that you could apply against Thrift itself. Um, I've actually never run across this bug. Nathan found it, um, or Nate found it. Uh, and and was running up against it when he was trying to do like hundreds of thousands of simultaneous startups and shutdowns, um, not simultaneous but um, uh, tests. So hundreds of thousands of tests to find these kind of bugs. Uh, but otherwise, we're pretty happy with uh, with the performance, with the capabilities, with the stability of it. Um, there is just a little bit of uh, of a learning curve. Uh, and, and maybe a few issues on the, the thrift side of things. Uh, but for the most part, most users, uh, if you, you know, you just follow the instructions on the wiki to build thrift, install it, build GNU Radio off of that, um, and then you can use the standard performance monitor and control port monitor uh, applications that come with GNU Radio and can then start building out your own, uh, your own applications based off of this new kind of RPC um, uh, connection abstraction layer that, that we've built into Python. Um, so yeah, and we're we're so we're we're hopeful on this one. Um, I wasn't because of these issues with concurrency and Thrift itself. I wasn't uh, sure enough to put it in three seven seven, which is why it waited until after the release on Monday. So we put this in you know this week because I, I want I want to have the entire run up to the next version release of GNU Radio, the next stable release, uh, for us to hit this. Um, you know, I'm, I'm fairly satisfied myself, but it's only because like a couple of us were using it. So now we want to get it out there and make sure it's uh, it's getting the attention uh, it, it it needs. But um, but yeah, hopefully it's uh it's our way forward with this kind of uh, functionality. Is there a link to wherever the patch is? Uh, it's actually in in the uh, GNU Radio itself. Um, oh, there's okay. a control port. Un well, yeah, I mean, it, you have to know where to look, but it's GNU Radio runtime lib control port thrift, and there's a patch, and there's even a readme file in there that explains a little bit more about what I just said. Cool. Um, but yeah, it's it's it. I just decided to release it or put it into the the code right now to keep it all centralized. That's cool. Okay. And hopefully nobody actually runs across this. Um, hopefully it's not a, a real in the field concern. If it becomes too much of a concern, we'll we'll see about thrift itself or, or working with the thrift people themselves on it. Okay, nice. Looks like we'll be having control pod back soon. Okay, um, I think that's it for this call. Forty-five minutes this time. Pretty good. Many announcements. Yep. Anything else anybody has? Okay, in that case, um, next call is uh, May May twenty first. Is that any is there anything going on? Okay, that is actually during the the new SDR. Thing. It's 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 on that day. New SDR. I f I have to look back at Neil's uh, announcement. I think New SDR actually starts at four p.m. Eastern. So, you know, the the dev call actually won't inter interfere with that. I'll I'll just be either in Worcester or on on route to Worcester during the okay. dev call. But yeah, it'll, so, be yeah. it'll be at the usual time. Um, I'll put in another announcement on the G plus page. Okay, everyone, thanks for joining. Um, see you next month. Bye bye. Thanks.